Thank you everybody for coming out once again to another IS session session. Uh, we got an event which I'm really excited for. This one's been in the works for quite a while. It's our co-op panel. We're going to be having five uh, brilliant co-op students or former student coming in to talk about their experience with co-op and give you the tips and tricks to land that dream position. Uh, before that, we're going to be doing our news roundup and then we'll be having a short break. But before all that, I want to make a special announcement. So we've talked a bit about our CTF here and we got some cool new information that I'm excited to share with you guys. So mark your calendars for January 14th and 15th because that's when the IS session CTF is going down. It's going to be hosted by our presenting partner, KPMG, in Toronto. Um, there will still be an online option for those who cannot make it down to downtown Toronto. Um, registration will be opening November, so keep your eyes open for that. Uh, spots, they may be limited. And also keep your uh, eyes open for potential events to help you prepare for our upcoming CTF. So aside from that, I think we're ready to get started with the news. Jackson, uh, feel free to take it away. Alright, hey everyone, uh, so in today's talk, uh, I will be discussing Iran's cyber operation against the Albanian government. Uh, so in July of 2020, 2022, sorry, uh, Iranian state cyber actors identified as Homeland Justice launched a destructive cyber attack against the government of Albania, which rendered websites and services unavailable. It also destroyed data, disrupted essential government services, including paying ut utilities, booking medical appointments, and enrolling in school children, uh, enrolling school children in schools. Attackers leaked sensitive Albanian government data, including details of emails from the Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs. An FBI investigation indicate, indicated that Iranian state cyber actors acquired initial access to the victim's network approximately 14 months before launching the destructive cyber attack, which included a ransomware style file encryptor and disk wipe malware. The actors maintained continuous network access for approximately a year, periodically accessing an extra fil exfiltrating email content. On July 18th of 2022, Homeland Justice claimed credit for the cyber attack on Albanian government infrastructure and the following day posted videos of the cyber attack on their website. From late July to mid-August of 2022, 20, uh, social media accounts associated with Homeland Justice demonstrated a repeated pattern of advertising Albanian government information for release, posting a poll asking respondents to select government information to be released by the Homeland Justice, and then releasing that information either in a zip file or a video of a screen recording with the documents shown. Initially, the group would execute arbitrary code to implant web shells on unpatched SharePoint instances that, in turn, enable them to upload files, download files, delete files, rename, and execute commands with an option to run as a specific user. Now, I'll pass it to Jess for the next part of the news content. Thank you. Um, hey guys, so this next story here. Uh, so this next story here is actually related to Grand Theft Auto and it's for Grand Theft Auto 6, which a lot of people have been waiting for. Um, so a week prior actually, there was a, a data breach um, on Uber by a person named Teapot Uber Hacker, which is actually associated with the hacker group Lapsus. Um, 
you can actually find the forum post of this person detailing his attack on the GTA forums. It might still be there. I will check Google. He also has a Twitter account. He's actually responsible for the release of 90 videos, totaling over 50 minutes of footage of development for GTA 6. He wanted to negotiate a deal with Rockstar for the return of unreleased data, which includes source code from GTA 5. And he also claims to be responsible for Uber's most recent data breach, as I mentioned. Um, in this case, Slack was actually used as the point of entry for his attack, where he gained access to an employee's credentials. And he did this by masquerading as an IT person, so social engineering, and he accomplished this. Uh, therefore, he was actually able to gain administrative access to the entire network as a result. So this actually warranted an investigation by the FBI. And eventually, through a joint investigation with uh, UK's cybercrime unit, it led to the arrest of a 17 slash 18 year old. I've also heard cases where they, he might actually be 16 years old. He was arrested after this investigation. And then the next person is Patrick. Um, not entirely yeah. sure. No, okay. Yeah. I'm thinking you just like maybe like a spike cloud data, so like botnet data. That's typically was where those credentials come from. Yeah, he, uh, the the sources I mentioned actually detailed how like he talked to an employee over like the phone, oh, okay. and he was actually able to gain credentials through that. Interesting. So yeah. the employee actually leaked that. Though. Yes. Yes, that's actually what it was. on uh, the Ukrainian government issued a warning about uh, massive cyber attacks by Russia that are aimed at uh, critical infrastructures within the nation of, of, of them and their allies. According to the main directory of intelligence, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense, or the GUR, the strikes were allegedly attacking their uh, energy industries by trying to affect the effectiveness of missile strikes at these uh, electricity supply fa uh, facilities, primary in the eastern and southern regions of Ukraine. The GWR also issued a warning of increased disturbance denial of services, assaults on Poland and the, and the Baltic nations of Estonia, Lavada, and Lithuania, which are strong friends of U Ukraine. Microsoft also warned of increased uh, Russian cyber attacks in June and noted the threat actors weren't just targeting government networks, they're attacking other stuff as well. And the next person will be up to sync. Hi everybody. Um, so just touched on that on this story a little bit. Um, Uber got hacked by the 18-year-old. Um, the way that they achieved it was through social engineering. They essentially spammed the, an employee at Uber with a bunch of uh, push mo push notifications about their login information, uh, and then they used WhatsApp to contact them, opposing posing as an IT uh, person at Uber, um, and basically just told them that if they wanted to stop that they have to uh, accept the access request. Um, they s sent proof to some researchers uh, to show that, that they achieved uh, the breach um, in the email, cloud storage, and so on. Uh, but surprisingly, for the Uber situation, they didn't attempt to uh, extort anything from the company, but did it for the lulls. Um, a researcher that was in contact with the, the hacker said that they pretty much got full access to Uber, and it was a total compromise using admin level credentials. Um, they got access to the PAM solution, and apparently it was protected by multi-factor authentication, but uh, they lacked it, um, other security methods, obviously. Um, so there were some researchers that were skeptical that it was just a single person, but clearly um, <laughs> they got caught. Um, and then just a, a little note here that Uber did pay back in 2016 to keep the story of getting hacked uh, pretty quiet and ended up uh, having to pay a $156 million fine. Uh, hey, 
everyone. This next article is about website spoofing. So researchers at Cybel Research and Intelligent Labs analyzed six websites imitating Zoom that trick users into downloading malware. The six sites listed here redirect to a GitHub URL on the back end and shows a page where applications can be downloaded. If the user downloads an application, two binaries are dropped into the temporary folder onto their machine. These are zoomin-1.exe and decoder.exe. The Vider Stealer malware, which has been around since 2018, is then injected into MS Build and establishes a connection with the threat actor's command and control center. Um, it's then able to steal users' information, such as banking data, IP addresses, safe credentials, and cookies. The stolen information is saved into Stealer logs, which are log files that can be then easily uploaded and sold in cybercrime marketplaces. The information in Stealer logs often provides other threat actors the initial access to breach other networks and the six sites are still active. All right, so this story comes courtesy of Tommy. I'll be filling in for him as he is celebrating his mother's birthday. So Tommy provided me the story about Twitter, which recently uh, released an update in order to remediate a bug. And this bug, what it did is, it, when you would change your login credentials, your password, it would not log out every session. Now, this is really concerning because a lot of users, when they're changing their credentials, they're doing so because they think it's possible that they might have been compromised. So the fact that uh, not every session is being logged out of, that could potentially mean that hackers are still getting access to your account even though, the, uh, even though you change your credentials. So, uh, excuse me. So Twitter suspects this bug might have been around for potentially even a year. It's a little bit unclear. They've been releasing notifications to users to uh, change their credentials and logging them out if uh, they suspect they've been uh, dealing with this bug. Uh, it's also recommended that anyone who uses Twitter right now should change their credentials uh, just in case. Uh, and I think that's all for our news. Uh, so we'll be able to get into our break here. We're running a little bit ahead of schedule. Maybe we can regroup at, say, 7.20. Hopefully we'll have the panel ready by then. Uh, CCR code is on the screen right now. Uh, so go ahead, fill that out, get your hours up, and we'll be back for the co-op panel. All right, everybody. Uh, hope you enjoyed your slightly extended break, slightly. Uh, we're ready now. We got our panelists lined up for you, and I think we're ready to get started with the co-op panel here. So first, um, let's just go around, uh, introduce yourself, uh, let us know what your position and company is, and give us a little bit of details on the duties of your role. So I guess we'll start with you. Sounds good. Hey everybody, uh, nice to meet you. My name is Louie. Um, so a little bit about me, I uh, actually used to be president of this very club uh, approximately three years ago. And then I bent the knee to another president because that was tradition back then. Um, his name's Kurt. He's on the way. He's late. What an, what an idiot. Um, I wanted that to be on camera. Uh, uh, and so I did my co-op as a threat hunter at uh, Bell Canada. Uh, Bell takes a lot of co-ops every year. Um, so definitely look at them. And it was a great co-op. Um, so I highly recommend it. Um, if you don't know what threat hunting is, threat hunting is essentially the act of hunting for malicious indicators on a corporate network. So you would um, hunt for those indicators and then you would maybe pass that information off to sort of the next tier. A huge part of your job as well is something called detection engineering. And detection engineering is the process of actually building um, queries, right, in a kind of sim or um, tool that allows you to actually find those malicious indicators that tell you that somebody is doing something bad in your network. So now I am at uh, Laris. Um, Laris is a boutique consulting company. Um, so I'm a purple teamer. Purple team is something between um, blue team and red team. So as a blue teamer, what you do is your job is to defend a network. As a red teamer, your job is to simulate an attacker. As a purple teamer, your job is to actually um, simulate an attack, just like the red team does, but also have enough expertise on the blue team side so as to advise um, the company on how you should, how they should defend their network. Right. 
Um, so we'll probably go into it in more detail later on. Uh, but yeah, that's me. Nice to meet you. Hi, my name is Christian. I'm, uh, I'm the vi current vice president, and right now I'm doing my co-op with KPMG Canada. Um, right now, I am a cybersecurity consultant. I mainly work in identity and access management, or IAM for short, with the, the occasional offensive security um, exercise to go along with it. So, um, since we have two other people here who are consultants in, uh, well, well, at least one other person who's a consultant in offensive security, I'll let him save his talk for that. So for identity and access management, um, pretty much most of what we do is uh, working with clients and implementing various technologies such as CyberArk and SailPoint, a lot of the times that are involving permissions. We're um, pretty much to avoid, you know, over permissive uh, on other accounts. Um, and pretty much it's a fundamental part of cybersecurity where you're making sure that um, accounts are configured in the right way, making sure that you have everything that's kind of based around access controlled in an environment where people aren't being over permissive and, it, uh, and it's fundamental for a lot of cybersecurity stuff in the sense that um, pretty much if let's say you're infiltrated on your network, one of the most common ways that people get hacked is by having a domain or by having a local administrator account. That's bad permission management. There's no reason why that account should be available on a computer. So pretty much a lot of what we do is help set those baselines that have prevent you know those long-term problems and help people get access to what they need and only what they need. And I'll let uh, Jen go on from here. Nice, yep, hey everyone, my name is Jen. I just uh, finished third year at Sheridan's cybersecurity program. I used to be the community manager of this club and uh, I think everyone here is an exec at some point, right, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm at Mandian right now. I'm on the proactive consultant team, which the proactive team is kind of like the offensive team. Um, proactive security, doing something before you have a breach, before you get attacked, or before you need to, you know, do anything, right? So, um, a lot of my job for the last, like, three months has been just red teams. Um, the offensive team does a lot more than just red teams. There's different kind of pen tests. There's uh, purple teams, uh, tabletop exercise, a lot of different stuff. But the three months that I've been, well, I've been there for six months now, but the last three months have been just strictly red teams. Before that, I helped out with some external pen tests. Um, I guess I'll get into, I think you had some questions related to those roles later on, so I'm not gonna dive too deep into those into those roles right now, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's right, right? You have some questions on those later on, I think? Well, you, you, we can work that out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, feel, I, I feel like there might be someone that dives deep into those. I don't wanna take we'll up- We'll look into it at some point. I don't wanna take up, I don't wanna take up too much time with introductions. I feel like this is, you yeah. know, it's, it's to oh, kind of get to know us. So yeah, it's, it's been a lot of, uh, lot of fun, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to help you guys out. Kyle, go for it. Um, so, hey, I'm Kyle. I'm currently working at Mandian as a strategic consultant there. Um, so, the, what, what is the job about? Um, so, the job is really just about PowerPoint and spreadsheets, to be honest with you. <laughs> no, no, we actually do like a lot of like documentation stuff, like business continuity plans, incident response plans, um, disaster recovery plans. Um, we do things like looking at like your security program from like an administrative perspective. Um, Some of things that like a CISO would do. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it. You can ask me some questions later and pass it on to Connor. Hi, so my name's Connor. I was the CTF coordinator last year with Kyle, who forgot to mention that, but he also worked on the CTF. Um, so right now I'm doing my co-op as a vulnerability researcher at Trend Micro. So vulnerability research is probably something you guys have never heard of. I had never heard of it even until like six months ago, pretty soon, like around when I started. Um, so what we do is our company runs a really large bug bounty program, which if you guys don't know what that is, basically people can, if they find a vulnerability or an exploit in a piece of software, they can report it to a vendor or a bug bounty program, then they can actually get paid for finding this. So when we buy bugs from people for these, our team on the vulnerability research team, we go into more detail and we've, we try to understand everything about it, because interestingly actually, a lot of the time when people find these bugs, they don't totally understand why the bug exists or you know, what, what's actually going on in the piece of software. All they know is that it can be exploited, which is not always the most actually useful piece of information. So we try to learn everything we possibly can about it so we can then build detections for you know, if somebody's able to detect it on a network, essentially. There's a little bit more to it than that. It, it's kind of hard to explain in a very short amount of time, but that's my uh, TLDR. All right, thank you guys. Uh, Jen, we'll start with you. You were always pretty dead set on getting into the red teaming side of mm -hmm. cybersecurity. 
So with that goal in mind, before your third year, before you even started looking, how did you help prepare yourself to land that role at Sheridan? For sure. Um, you mean I made it? Well, I mean, like, how did you prepare at Sheridan? Oh, landing that um, role while at Sheridan, yeah. Um, Honestly, anyone that's kind of known me since first year, known me since, you know, the first few classes that, that we started kind of taking, very early on I was trying to get people to, you know, do CTFs with me, do Hack the Box with me, do, you know, try Hack Me. It actually started out with um, with uh, Over the Wire Bandit, because I had never used Linux before coming here, right? So, but I knew after watching, you know, so many episodes and reruns of Mr. Robot that I really just wanted <laughs> to be a hacker. Like, it's, you know, it's funny to say out loud, but I, you know, I just, that was the part that kind of spoke to me. And you know, you'd hear kind of the horror stories of, you know, Jen, it's not just hacking, there's reporting and client side and you know, all this stuff, but I just knew that I wanted to be on the keyboard, even with the reporting, whatever I wanted to hack. So right from first year, I kind of just didn't waste any time. I got very busy with, uh, you know, different training sites, um, you know, different exercises, CTFs, challenges, that kind of stuff. I think I listed some of them out, but you know, Ring Zero is a really good one, uh, Hack the Box, I think they've kind of, from the time that I started using Hack the Box and now they've grown to this like international, Hacking, it's insane. It's they really have an awesome platform now. Um, try hacking is pretty good too. Try hacking is amazing now. Yeah, Sheridan CTF. Sheridan yeah. CTF is the best yeah. one out of all of these. That's like a mandatory yeah. almost. But yeah, uh, that you know, I didn't have the chance to do that when I first started. Um, uh, what was I just gonna say? Uh, CTFs, challenges. I was just gonna say something. Then I said the Sheridan CTF. Yeah, it's it's a lot of just kind of self studying. I mean, if you if you kind of want to make this happen, you can't really wait around until you get these classes because you're not going to really get, you know, red teaming or offensive classes until fourth year. It really doesn't happen. The ethical class isn't, isn't until after your co-op. So if you want to seek out a co-op like this, you really just have to start now. Um, it's not going to, you know, fall in your lap. But it's, yeah, it's really just what you're passionate about. Um, that's what I wanted to do. So I didn't want to wait. I just started doing it. So kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, when you were being interviewed for that Mandian position, mm -hmm. One of the interviews was a pretty hefty technical one. How did you prepare for that one? Yeah, there was actually two technical, there was one written technical um, interview, like not interview, but like an assessment. And then there was the actual technical interview, which was, it was, you know, it was pretty hard. To be honest with you, for prepping, I, I sought Lue. You kind of, you know, it, it was, I, I, the idea that, you know, a lot of red teaming, modern red teaming revolves around Active Directory and Windows. So I kind of got the idea that, and that was one of my weak spots, I got the idea that I should probably work on that the most. I knew that Louie had a lot of experience with, with that kind of stuff, with where he was currently. Not, so not a lot, but. More than me. <laughs> more, than, <laughs> more, than, more than me. Enough to, enough to help me out. So I, I, I reached out to him and uh, it was very kind. I think he, he took the night to just go over some key topics. I made some dot shot notes, I studied, I dug deeper obviously, that wasn't enough, I had to you know, pull up blog posts, that kind of thing, but as far as preparing for that specific interview, that was the only real kind of weakness that I felt I had as far as my, my web app stuff I felt pretty good in, um, now that's the complete opposite, I feel like that's my worst area after working there for six months and seeing actual AppSec gurus do their thing, I, I genuinely feel like my, my AppSec is garbage, but um, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's, it was seeking out the way and then supplementing it with a lot of a lot of blog posts, a ton of blog posts. So you knew yeah. beforehand the types of topics they were going to be asking you about. This wasn't a pop quiz. Not really. No, it was very it was very unknown. So there's two things that I'll say on this. One, what I know is that in, you know in modern offensive security kind of the landscape, everyone just runs their businesses off of Windows, right? That's kind of what drives the world. It's just Active Directory. You know, domains, forests, uh, DAs, certificates, trusts, you know, it, it's all about DA, and I knew that I had zero experience with this. I hate to say it, it's primarily because the Sheridan program doesn't really have any Windows classes. You're not gonna learn any Active Directory or Windows sysadmin stuff at Sheridan, so if you don't go out and- They didn't change, they do now. They didn't, they didn't have that at the time when I was here. They did not have that. I think they have it now or something, but regardless, I had to, on my own, so that wasn't so much that I had. I, I didn't. I wasn't given any heads up about what's going to be on the interview, but I knew that that surely would be because it's a red teaming role. So that's what I, you know, wanted to, to, to study the most. The other thing I was going to say is, with my interview, I was really lucky. The interviewers that I had were very good at kind of picking up what my strengths were and what my weaknesses were, and they wouldn't spend too much time on the weaknesses. They knew that if I couldn't answer something, they're not going to hammer me on it. I couldn't answer the damn thing. Right? There's no point in sticking around this. They really played to my strengths. Um, I got really lucky in that sense, but um, no, no, it wasn't. There was, it was a very pop quiz style. I had no idea what was happening. Um, it was an assumption. So, yeah. so can I just add something there? That's okay. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and, and I just want to point that out, like what he said there about the interviewers actually being really, really helpful. Um, I've, in my experience, found that to be true in most organizations. So it's not like, you know, they want to see you cry. They really just want you to be open and genuine and really just tell them what you know, right? More importantly, what you don't know. If you don't know yeah. it, do not pretend. And, and that's a different topic. Yeah. And, and the big thing as well about what you don't know is that they want you, they want you to say the words when you don't know something, I don't know. Yeah, four because minutes. honestly, like I've been at my job for like you know a year now, and I probably still don't know like 90% of the things that my colleagues that have been there for 10 years do, right? Um, it is perfectly understandable that you don't know things. So make sure you say, I don't know when you don't know something because it's gonna be taken the wrong way. Your quickest ticket to failing an interview is trying to explain something that you actually don't understand. To people that are top of the level, top yeah. of the food chain, expert level you know, people in that topic. So you try to BS them, they instantly, they'll probably, they won't even stop you from talking. They'll just yeah. like to keep talking. Yeah. Just because it's funny to watch, you know what I mean? These guys are like, <laughs> like they write the papers that you read on on medium or the blog posts you see on Twitter. Like you, you can't really lie to these guys. So yeah, the, the best advice I think, as far as interviewing goes, probably the best advice you're gonna get from tonight is just to look somebody in the face and say, I, I don't know that one. Next question, because that's yeah. So sticking along with the topic of interviews here, mm -hmm. uh, does anybody else have sort of tips and tricks that they use in order to? The big thing I had prepared was going to mention the exact same thing that Jem and Luai just went over. Um, I think there, there's a lot of resources you can find online. I mean, there's Glassdoor. You know, you can always, especially for bigger companies, it's not you know uncommon to if you just Google you know company X position, you can probably find some stuff related to it. Um, or I mean, if you end up doing like a programming interview, stuff like that, you know, you can always do lead code. It, it can be really helpful. Um, but yeah, there, there are a ton of resources online. And you know, as, as Jim mentioned, like, they're, they're not gonna ask you stuff that's like really advanced. They don't expect students to know advanced stuff for any of these jobs. A majority of stuff they're gonna ask you about is stuff on your resume. So be 100% sure if you have anything on your resume, you will get asked about it and you need to be able to speak to it. Because if they ask you a question about something you have on your resume and you can't answer it, you're going to look like a complete idiot and they're not going to give you the job just based off that alone. It's a really, really, really big problem if you ever do that. Yeah, you might think you're doing yourself a favor by getting the interview, you know, putting a lot of stuff on your resume. You at least get your foot in the door. You might be thinking, well, at least I get the interview, then I'll show them. But the moment they ask you that question based on something you put on there and you freeze up, it's game over. So it's better to have a, I hate to say the word weak, but a less, you know, a less embellished, less fruitful resume and go in and knock everything out of the park rather than have, you know, this awesome looking superstar resume and you just, you know, don't know a thing that's on it. It's, it's yeah, really good. So like the way that I prepare for interviews is I, um, well, are you talking about the short term or the long term? Like just like right before the interview type of thing or like more like what you're doing in school to prepare for these things? Let's, do, let's go short term. So like in the short term, I look at like the job posting and just see like what are the type of jobs and duties and responsibilities yeah, that we're gonna be doing in, uh, in that job. And like if there's something that I don't know, I'll look into it. Or if there's something that I wanna brush up on, I'll brush up on that. And like it's just like to have like a good idea of like what you're getting into, like for the job position, um, what you're gonna be doing. Um, something else that's also good to do is like just to sort of do like a little bit of research about the company itself. Um, Sometimes they'll ask you like, oh, do you know what we do? Like, what is our mission and stuff like that? And like, if you don't know anything about them, you just be like, well, are you just here for the job? Well, the truth is you are, but <laughs> you gotta make them feel nice, you know? So, um, yeah, it's like some things that are sort of prepared like short term for an interview. Yes, no, that, that, that's, that, that is a really important thing. You definitely need to know like, you don't need to know a lot about the company, but you need yeah. to know a general idea of what they do. Like, you know, take five minutes to Google them. That, you don't need any more than that. And another thing as well, um, one thing that really helps me is think about just like your life, your, your professional life, and pick out success stories um, from the things that you have done in the past, right? So maybe you've gone to like a CTF, you've, you've done a CTF competition, right? So maybe say like, um, talk about you know how you brought a team together, right? That's teamwork skills that you're demoing, right? Talk about where you finished in the CTF, right? 
and give context as to, you know, I was a beginner and I ended up finishing in the top half. That's impressive, right? That's a, that's a success story. Um, the other thing as well is that every story has to start with, you know, a headline. So this is, this is more so about like when you're actually speaking in an interview. You headline something, you say a sentence, like, I um, finished first in this CTM, right? And then you go into a bit more detail, and then your last sentence is always like an impact statement. And from that CTF, I learned X, Y, and Z, right? Um, structuring everything that you say this way makes it very clear to the interviewer that you have stories and things that you are proud of, things that um, will eventually, hopefully, land you the job. You also have to remember that it's not just about technical skills, right? Most of us here work in consulting type jobs. That means that we are talking to people all the time, right? Um, so if you are not you know, a good speaker, if you're not a good communicator, that's not gonna re reflect well. So you have to show them that side of you as well, right? And that is definitely something that can be taught. It's kind of, it's kind of hard, right, for mo most people in IT, by very, like nature, they're not, you know, they're, they're they're gaming or they're playing WoW or something like that, right? They're not, by their very nature, like very <laughs> They're more introverted, open. man. Come introverted, on, that's, that's the word. That's the word. This guy's No, no, I wasn't even introverted. Come on, man, you're introverted. That's the word you're looking for. You know what, it's Jem, he's, 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 he's not very good at upset, as he said. <laughs> but, but, he is voted the funniest guy in the I will say that. No, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true, man. Why are you lying? <laughs> Move on. What was I saying? Was right. saying? I don't remember what I was saying. Introverted. So people say Action so people yeah. 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 So, yeah. So you need to be good at speaking. You know, that's right. That's, that's right. Honestly, just like before the interview, just like stand in front of a mirror and read the headline, give detail, and give impact statements, and have those stories ready, and just do it as many times as you need to. Um, your goal is not to memorize, obviously, because it still has to be organic. They have to feel like you are managing the conversation as it happens. Um, but, um, you know, definitely a skill that can be learned, definitely you know, a big recommendation for practicing for interviews. I know we're kind of beating this dead at this point, but um, I kind of wanted to continue off with what uh, Louis was saying. And um, one of the more important things, especially with what he said about, um, it was kind of like what you're saying, like kind of like um, accomplishment statements, right? Yeah, exactly. So the important thing about accomplishment statements is that when you're in an interview, they don't want to just hear what you can do. They want to hear how you grow, and they want to hear how you continue to grow. Because remember, as an intern, uh, as we kind of all, I think most of us have said here, is that they don't expect you to know everything. The most important thing to them is to see how you can grow. Do you listen? Do you want to learn? If you're able to do all that, then that tells them that you're going to be a great intern. Again, they don't want someone who's going to sit there and lie and say that they know everything. Because hey, worst case scenario, let's say you do get it and you lied your way to get there, then you're, you're in trouble when you actually have to do work that you're not able or capable of doing. Um, don't don't fake it till you make it. Like try to s just say, be honest and say that you don't know, but show how you want to learn. Show how you have learned before. That's the type of thing that's important to them. Um, and kind of also going off with what um, Uwe was saying about um, you know the headline first. Another way that we and it kind of resonated for me a little bit because um, it was um, it's something that Todd, one of my um, coworkers, taught me is that it's kind of like the similar thing. Um, we called it a bottom line up front. But it's kind of like, you know, with that headline, always start off with what you want to talk and then give the details. Pretty much take your main point and then you can worry about the little stuff later. Too long, didn't read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Jeff, you told me that you had three interviews for your Mannion position. It, right. I just want to know, is this a pretty standard amount of interviews? How many interviews did you guys have uh, for your position that you landed? I had three as well, yeah. It depends on the company. I, I, I think that the standard is probably two for most companies. Right. Some of them will do three for you know typically like larger companies like Mandiant or like you know big tech companies. Um, but two two is pretty standard, I would say. Um, sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so no, for me, I actually had uh, for Bell, I had one giant interview, like a two-hour interview, um, in which they grilled me <laughs> for two hours, <laughs> uh, but respectfully, obviously. Uh, and uh, then for Laris, I had like a 15 minute interview. Um, for both of them, I was actually referred by another person, so that helped a lot, right? So there was no need to actually um, you know, have 
a crazy ton of interviews. People just kind of like knew what I'd done. They knew what, you know, the things that I've accomplished already. So it was just like a formality, to be honest. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but you know, being involved is super important, and getting to that point is is would be really cool, right? How? Oh, sorry, yeah. Finish the last. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I won't stop. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Saying, uh, like, in terms of like interview skills, like you talk about like referrals and things like that. How important is networking? Do you think? It's oh, like, man. Think it's the, it's like, the yeah. most important thing. It's more important than any technical skill. Any like it's it's the single most important thing. I would say it's you know, if you can get somebody or find somebody that can vouch for you, that knows you, that can, you know help you get your foot in the door. You know, you might not be the most qualified person, but this person that is there is saying, you know, he's coachable. He has good character, or she. I keep saying he, but I'm thinking about my own story. You know, if you have somebody that can actually say, you're right, they're not the most technical person, but I've known this person for, you know, three years. They're always the first to put their hand up to help. They're always the first to volunteer in the club, or, or you know, they're very well-liked character in the, in the community. That's going to go so much further than that extra, you know, attack vector that you may have mastered, or that extra technology that you might have picked up. I think networking is a, it's irreplaceable. Irrepla it's not even comparable to anything else. Yeah, and, and, and to help sub sell how important networking is, I would say that more than half of us here probably, at least networking helped us get our positions to a certain degree. Um, and then you might be saying, okay, but how do I network? So kind of like how Jim was saying is that, you know, volunteer at these clubs, uh, make yourself known. Um, the CTF, for example, get to know other people in the industry, get to know the sponsors that are there. Um, when you come to these talks, speak to our speakers after the fact. You have such an amazing resource with this club and the people who are involved with it that honestly the big, and like even this, in my opinion, this is just how I think the best way to use school. It's not even so much that you're paying for the education. You're paying for the ability to speak with all the amazing people around you yeah. and get to learn everything that they can have to provide. Because maybe you might not know someone in offensive security and you want to do offensive security, but the, maybe the person next to you know someone in offensive, in offensive security. Maybe you know someone in forensics and one of your friends would be interested in getting to know that person. Maybe your professor knows someone who can reach you out to, to the right person. Pretty much is this entire club, this entire program should be seen as a resource. Every time you see these events, go out of your way to do them. And um, I saw over you yeah, a blue shirt there, you had a question there. Question about, uh, co and resumes. Yeah, exactly what Christian just said. I mean, uh, ideally you'd be able to fill it out with stuff like this, right? I helped out of the club with this event, that event. I did the news, I gave a talk. Or you could, if you're really active in you know, challenges and CTFs, you could say, hey, I you know, participated in this and that. So in, in a security program, those would be your primary kind of, your projects, because we're not in a development program, right? I mean, if you were in a dev program, you would say, oh, well, here's my GitHub, here's my, I worked on this and that. So you might have those. A lot of us code, obviously, a lot of us are, are good at that, but you, you know, chances are that's not your primary focus, right? So, like I said. Also, things like, uh, like if you have like a home lab or something like that, um, and you do that, right, like, yeah, for sure. build up some labs, um, do like some, like a, set up a Windows environment with Active Directory. Talk about your tech stack, talk about, you know, the stuff that you've learned when you're setting it up, what kind of, you know, What's your, what's your network looking like, right? That kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't been here since, it's like, you know, I kind of bridged into this program. This is my, I started off my third year at Sheridan just because I've bridged in. But uh, for example, I don't know if um, kind of just add on what they were saying as well is that um, your assignments. So if you've literally done nothing like outside of um, cybersecurity, something that might help, or even like if you just had a project that you liked a lot or maybe even went above and beyond on, either way, it doesn't matter. Pretty much what you can do is you can use those school assignments that you've done and you're able to showcase what you've learned from them. You're able to put them on your resume. It's true. Especially in third year, that secure software dev class, like, <laughs> not like bleeding edge amazing, but there's some projects on there you could say, you know, yeah, I, you know, I set up a, a web server that was, I built it to be vulnerable, I exploited it and then I fixed it and I confirmed, like, you know, like little stuff like this that when you're doing it, you're like, oh, I can't believe this is due tomorrow, this sucks. But then, you look back three months, six months, and you're like, damn, so that's a pretty cool thing to do. I just, you know, I set up my own infrastructure. I made sure it was broken. I broke it more, and I fixed <laughs> it. And, you know, that's a, that's a lot of crucial stuff, right? It's not just developing. It's actually understanding some pretty, like, fundamental vulnerabilities. And this really is, like, depending on what you want to do. If you want to get into forensics or, you know, SOC or whatever, that's, it's still going to be cool, but it's not going to, like, 
They're not gonna, that's not gonna be the make or break. They're not gonna say, oh, well, you know, you know what a buffer overflow is at depth? You're hired. So it depends on the role, but a lot of what Christian said applies. There's a lot of projects you do. Some of them are big honking projects. You could probably slap them on there and, you know, fill out your resume a bit, yeah. Yo, so I have a question. So how much uh, do marks really matter when it comes to uh, applying for co-op or getting uh, in your gym? That's a great question. That's a good um, question. So That's a really good question. Answer. I hate that question. I was <laughs> <laughs> uh, just going to say, you mentioned the SSH server. My SSH server broke unintentionally for about 20 days before work. Uh, so yeah, that did not get a good mark on that side. Um, no, yeah, so... Look so, at you now, right? Look at you. <laughs> I thought we weren't going to do this. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> he works at Benji. <laughs> Focus on the question. Come on. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So a grades... Uh, so uh, grades, I would say, are important, but only important up to a point, right? Um, so I would say, like, for, for this program, you know, I've gone through this program, I think if you have, like, a 78 and above, honestly, that's pretty good enough for most positions. You, you know, after that point, it's really gonna be more about what kind of personal projects have you done, how much community involvement do you have, um, and also just how well you present yourself, how well your communication skills are. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers your question. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about you know, what kinds of stuff you can do to get involved. To put things in perspective a bit for you, you know, all of first and second year, even a bit into third year, I was obsessed about my grades. Like I would get into competitions with this guy who got the highest grade. Like we were, you know, we almost stopped being friends at no, the sure. Obviously, I was one. You know, yeah, one. okay. <laughs> we, were, we were obsessed over our grades, honestly. And as far as like me getting my, I'm not saying it had like no role. I'm sure you know, the people that I spoke to and you know, even my interviewers knew that I wouldn't be learning the stuff that I was without at least somewhat good grades, but nobody asked me about my grades. I don't even think I had to, because it wasn't through the job board, I don't even think I had to put my grades as like a, in, the, in the appendix of the resume. Like it wasn't. I, I don't think it played any direct factor. That's not to say I still am happy that I, you know, busted my ass because I learned so much. But honestly, all those like super late nights studying to make sure I get the, the 98 or the, you know, 100, whatever, maybe I would have spent a little bit, tiny bit less time and spent more time on self studying things that I really care about. Maybe. That's me personally. Somebody else might say, that's a slippery slope. You start not caring a little bit, you start not caring a lot. I don't know. But for me personally, I know that. You know, the difference between spending six hours or seven hours studying for an exam and like spending three or four hours, probably not gonna be, you know, it's a, uh, what's, yeah, I forget the term. It's not, the, the, the rewards aren't like, you know. It's marginal. Yeah, yeah I, I would definitely, I would definitely not have. I, I, I would say that, you know, having good grades is definitely good, but you know, having, you know, average size, average grades is not bad. No. Like that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, I don't, I definitely do not have amazing grades like either of these two do. And I've talked with all my friends and them many times about my approach to school. And I mean, I know that the stuff that I'm interested in, a lot of the courses we take don't really go into the kind of stuff that uh, my job does or the stuff that I'm interested in. And I've just kind of made the choice, you know, I would rather spend two hours instead of eight hours studying for something and just take a 75. And it has not affected me getting interviews at all. I, it's, like, I, I don't have a you know, fantastic GPA, I have like 3.3, something like that. And if you have something like that, you are not gonna have problems. It's, it's not a big deal at all. That's the approach I would take if I was to start first year again. But I'm not promoting not to study. I'm just saying I've, I've witnessed what he's done. Like he's, you know, no offense, Connor. I'm gonna <laughs> air you out a little bit, but like, you know, not coming to class while I'm like, oh, Connor's not here again? How's he doing so, like, it doesn't make any sense. But I understand now, right? Hindsight's 20-20. It paid off for him, and I really think that yeah, it's just like a, it's like a prioritizing what you want more. You know, like that better GPA, maybe getting that reward at the end of the year. You know, the the whatever token that you did the best out of everybody. You know, amazing. But what do you care about more? Yeah. Right? Sorry, more? J j just yeah. to elaborate on what I said. So I, I, I don't want to you know just say like you should not care about your classes and then just not do anything. Right. I I definitely did not put it as much effort into my classes as some other people did. But you know, in that extra time that I chose to not spend on my classes, I was doing a lot in my oh, extra you're still working. Yeah, you're yeah still I, I did a lot of stuff in my free time that like in the CTF. Yeah, I mean, working on the you're CTF or just doing extracurricular stuff. Like I, I did a, a pretty pretty large amount of stuff, 
And I mean, you absolutely can all do that too, you know. Definitely just get involved with the club. That is the most important thing you can do. Get involved. Kind of extending on what Connor was saying is that um, you know if you're just getting average grades, then no, you're not in a better place than someone who's getting higher grades. But if you're getting nice. average grades yeah. and you're doing stuff on the side, then that's what makes you stand out a little bit more. Because remember, is that when these companies look at you, is like they're going to kind of like see like all these different little factors. Getting an average of 95 is really good, and that's obviously going to put you ahead of someone who has 75 and nothing else to show. But if you have a 75, but you also have these other interesting projects and you're able to show off everything when you're not expected to necessarily do it and you're showing the things that you're doing out of your own time, then that, to, I find from my experience, maybe everyone else, well, at least from what I've heard from everyone else, is that interviewers like to hear more about that kind of thing rather than school. And especially kind of like when, it, like, let's say if you want to do offensive security or you want to do forensics. Um, the thing is with school is that it's very generalized. If you're trying to go for something very specific, when you're able to show off more than what school provides in that specific area, then that starts to appeal to them a little bit more because it shows that you're able to fit those qualifications a little bit better. Right. I just wanted to add one thing though, it's a little uh, of a tangent, but um, you should probably try to pay attention to all your classes because like you never know where you're going to end up. And like for me personally, I know oh, that's true for you. I, right? I know. Super for me personally, I like I would I always hated like the info set classes. Like I'd be like, oh, I'm never gonna use this. And then like where I ended up getting my internship, I had to do like nice. exclusively these uh, type of classes. <laughs> so like just use like school as an opportunity to like get a little piece of like all the different industries and um, don't don't take anything for granted. So none of this is advocating like not going to classes. Yeah. Just yes. <laughs> saying yeah, if you're gonna get the 75, you better have a insane resume to go along with it of all the cool stuff you've done on the side. It's, we're not saying, you know, forget the grades. We're saying, yeah, we're saying if you're not going to get that 3.97, your resume better have every stinking CTF for the last three years, all the challenge sites, the training sites. You better be going to every conference. I want to see, a, you know, DEF CON 416, B-sides, IS sessions. What are the other ones? Sector. Sector. <laughs> okay, you don't need all that. that. <laughs> 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 so, sorry. Speaking of other stuff that's interesting, did you guys know this guy is a two-year professional poker player? <laughs> Doesn't he just look like a professional poker player? Where are the glasses? 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 Where have you networked with any professors? And if you have, uh, you know, who, or if you had any meaningful talks with professors? Only one. And they're, 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 I did not. They're no longer here. I would say the old coordinator of the program oh, Nick, was yeah. instrumental, kind of, in hyping me up about security. And, you know, but he's not that sure anymore. I'm sure he's still approachable. And he's in the Discord. Yeah, I'm sure he's still, you know, he's still an infosec. He's just not teaching anymore. Um, he might even be listening on YouTube right now. He might could be, be yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've added some props on, like they've asked me when I'm you know, finishing class, make sure you connect on LinkedIn, that kind of thing, but they're all so busy teaching and doing their own thing that I'm sure they might know people in this industry, but I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to rely on props as like a way in. I feel like there's so many other connections you can make from going to these things than somebody that is just so busy doing their own thing that what are they going to do, right? Recommend. How many students probably come up to them? Hey, I got you know a 90 in your class. You know, who are they going to choose, right? So I would say go to these types of things, go to other conferences. You know, B sides is coming up like next weekend. That's like week, it's 50, like bucks, 50 bucks. You know what I mean? You go for two days, you meet everybody who's anybody. It's super close. It's, it's in Toronto. So um, I, to answer your question, I would say no, but I would also say that's not necessary. It kind of actually, I do have a per. Uh, sorry, did you no, 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 go ahead. Uh, so I actually kind of have like a personal story coming out of Fleming College. Is actually kind of well, not so much of a personal story, but what I've seen from my own eyes when we were looking for our co-ops at Fleming. Um, it, you know, we have we had a lot of great professors at Fleming, um, and you know they were fantastic at teaching. But um, when it came for people finding jobs and co-ops, the P, the professor that people got their jobs and co-op through was a last minute substitution professor halfway through the semester that worked full time as a consultant. Wow. Um, I, and I don't think that's it's necessarily a coincidence because of the fact that it's, it's just that um, with um, business and education, at least from my experience, maybe you, these guys disagree, you can feel free to chime in, but I feel like there's a bit of a little bit of a disconnect when it comes to what actually happens in a business versus what you're theoretically taught. So for example, you're told that um, you know, a Windows 95 uh, server 
is garbage, which, you know, in today's day, you know, it's not a good thing to maybe run off of that. But then you start to learn that people need to rely on it. Then you need to learn about, like, all these different you know, kind of, like, internal business things that they have to go to why they're not switching in. And it's just, I feel like when you actually get into the industry, you start to learn that there is a little bit more difference between the education and the, um, the actual business side of things. I, professors, if you want to go into education, absolutely, and I don't, and I don't think it ever hurts to ask a professor because you know, we, we, personally, I haven't spoken too much to any of our professors, and who knows, they might have great experiences. But I would say that honestly, even honestly, even after I said all that, regardless of what I said, um, whenever you see um, a, a presenter here or a professor, take just. And especially with uh, for us on the consultant side, this is one of the biggest things that we're told. Always go for coffee chats with people. Always network. It doesn't matter who it is, because honestly, at the end of the, even though I've said all that, at the end of the day, is it never hurts to just sit down and have 15, 30 minutes to network with someone and just see what they know or who they know, or even just to get to know them better and have a better idea of what they're interested in, pretty much anything relating to that. We also have some uh, Discord questions here, which I want to get into. I don't think it's any question of yours. Well, yeah, it's okay. Join we can do this via the World Wide Web. Please feel free to send in your questions. I'll try to stay on top of it a bit more. So this one from Not John. Uh, were your entry level roles in the CyberSec uh, usually involving paperwork slash compliance before you moved into higher level positions like research? So what was the actual question? Are there weird? We're, no, no, no. Were no, no. our entry level roles? Is that, that was... These are our entry level yeah, roles. So yeah, all yeah. My first, this is my first yeah. job in InfoSec, yeah. All, all, yeah. Lou, so Lui's threat hunting job was his first one, I believe, and the rest of us... Sorry, what was, the, what was the question? It's okay, I can, I can speak for that. Yeah, yeah. that's not a problem. So, so, the question. so um... Oh, what was the job? Well, I would say that... I, I guess the heart of the question is, are you going to be doing kind of like um, more sort of non-technical work when you start a position, you know, that's entry level, right? Um, yeah, 100%, right? The first thing you realize when you actually go into the industry is just how incredibly stupid you are, right? Like, compared to the people that are actually working there, even though you've gone through four years of school, you will realize that you are still miles away from what they can do. So you're gonna ask yourself the question, okay, well, how do I stand out? And this is actually especially important for people in co-op roles because you're trying to land full-time, right? So how do you actually stand out in your role, right? This is my approach and it's worked really, really well for me. Um, I actually love whenever people complain about the stuff that they, um, it, it's like the stuff that they, it's the stuff they always complain about but they have no time to fix. For me as an intern, that's like music to my ears because I'm like, okay, that's something that they've hired me for. And just by getting the exposure, just by talking to them, I'm gonna learn a bunch of things. Just to give you a couple of like examples. Um, when I started at Bell, one of the biggest sort of problems was the fact that we had in our SOC, um, we had a whole bunch of alerts and there was a lot of false positives uh, on those alerts. So the SOC team, you know, the analysts, basically spent their entire day just um, closing tickets, closing tickets, closing tickets, because there would just be a flood, right? So one thing that I was really good at from like, because uh, I went to business school was Excel, right? So what I did was I actually um, built this just Excel sheet just to show what the noisiest sort of queries are, which ones are generating the most alerts. And then I used like a little bit of statistics to show that there are queries that are actually showing um, a statistically significant amount of alerts past a certain, certain threshold that just by virtue of risk, this is very unlikely to be a malicious event. And then I said, you know what? 50% of these rules, absolute garbage. We should take them down, right? And that had a lot of, a lot of impact, right? I didn't actually do anything technical. I just did some simple math and some stuff with Excel, right? But it went a long way. Same thing at Laris. Um, so this is my full-time position. One of the things that all the consultants would always complain about is how shitty reporting is, right? Everybody wants to do the cool hacky stuff, but nobody wants to write the report. So what I would do is every time that somebody would write like a really great piece, like in, in one of the reports, I would actually take it out, 
and then um, you know paste it into like a document, and I would centralize, kind of create like a knowledge base where people can paste and copy and paste things out of reports, and, and out of that knowledge base in the future reports, right? And now, just just by doing something as simple as that, just by centralizing that information, the amount of time it takes to write a report has gone down from like two weeks to a single day, right? So you as an intern can do very, very powerful things without doing actually anything technical. Just a third example, I just to hammer this point. Um, it takes a very, very long time. Shut up, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. It's good. No, it's good. <laughs> you're really hammering the point home. I love it. Oh, yeah. It's good. So what's the good example? Hammer you home. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, no, the third example was uh, I built this tool called Storyteller. So every time that like a red teamer needs to do something, they need to actually like compile the bad thing that they want to do something with, right? And because we have different clients, we want to change the tool based on different clients. So I wrote like this basically this script that essentially compiles all of my tools for me in a very automated fashion. Um, that's kind of related to like programming skills. A lot of people will say programming skills are not really super important in this industry. For me, that's actually helped me a lot. I had a huge interest in programming, and it's like been just for me walking in and just seeing like how just inefficient some things are. You can write some very simple like 200 line Python scripts and PowerShell scripts that will save incredible amounts of time, and everybody will love you for it. As an intern and as a beginner, as a job. And now I'm done. Back to you, Jim. <laughs> Back to you, Jack. <laughs> Back to you, Jack. So we mentioned uh, Windows as one thing. Were there any other tools uh, that you learned in the field yeah. that are not taught at Sheridan? Sorry, uh, anything else that's not taught at Sheridan? Yeah, anything specific uh, you want to know? Yeah, I don't know if like not taught, but I think a lot of the stuff that people want to do, even if they are taught, they're taught really late. Like by the time co-op class rolls around, you know, your malware analysis for your reverse engineering guys, your, your secure software or software development or, you know, AppSec, that's in the third year, it's right before co-op. Ethical hacking, it's in fourth year, it's after co-op. So I don't think the question should be, you know, what's not taught besides Windows. It should be like, when are things taught and is that gonna be enough time for you to, you know, learn it enough to get this co-op job? And the answer to a lot of those things is no. I would say even something like, like I mean, you know, more, more entry level defensive jobs like SOC, this and that, you're right, you don't learn those until third year as well, but those kind of you can learn on the job. But these more like kind of specialized roles that a lot of you guys kind of glorify or kind of, you know, you navigate towards, you're, you're not really gonna learn that stuff until late. You will learn them at some point in school, very, very like superficially, you know, very high level. It's just not gonna be enough, enough depth. But it's gonna be too late. I really think if you wait until, and that was something that I actually heard from multiple people when I was in first year. And I was trying to invite people out to these CTFs or these challenges, or hey man, like, you know, did you go to that site that I told you to, you know, make an account on? What's your score? What do you, I would always get hit with, man, like I have assignments, I have this, I have that. And Gem, I looked at the, the curriculum, we actually learned this stuff in fourth year, man. That was, that was literally what I was told by not one, not two, but like multiple people that I would try to kind of, you know, bring with me to learn together. And I would just get shut down because the, they, they were like, why would I do this now when we have a whole class about it? And at the time, I think they really thought that like, these classes were gonna be bleeding edge, they're gonna teach it better than anybody could ever teach you. So that, maybe that was their reasoning, I don't know why you would wanna get a head start anyways, but to answer your question, um, it's not that they're not taught, it's just too late, you really just have to you know, go out and do it. I just wanna add to that though, like in my experience though, like, um, so with the, when I was on the high sessions exec team, I was doing like infrastructure for the CTF, um, so I learned like a lot of skills about like cloud technologies um, or things like Kubernetes and Docker. Um, so like if you want to sort of head that direction um, with your career, like you're not going to get taught that in class. Uh, you have to really have to go and pursue that on your own time. But one thing I would say just to add on in your specific case, you had been building your home lab and doing like, you know, pretty intense stuff with your own network for like three years before you ever got into that. That was like your thing, you know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. this is something that you didn't even, it, it seems like um, there, there has to be like a, like a intrinsic enjoyment you get out of the stuff that you do. If you're looking at these things, not always, this is a kind of 
may, maybe a little wishy-washy thing to say, but if you're looking at these things of like, how can I get you know the best paying job or this job or that job? That's kind of the wrong reason. Like Kyle, when he started his home lab, wasn't like I'm going to do this and be a network architect. Mm -hmm. No, he was like I want to I want a Plex server in my house. I want to make sure that all my meet like. And then he started from that. Then he started getting to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. But there has to be like this, like this foundation base level of enjoyment that you get out of this. You can't just think like, oh, what is the highest paying? Google highest paying job. And it looks like, those are the things I want to do. Well, if you're not, if you're going to hate that, then you're not going to be successful. You're not going to want to do it, right? It's not going to be fun. So, yeah. I but think, don't let uh, that discourage you, though, because like you, you never know what you live enjoy until you do it. So like try right, everything. Right. Yeah. You might. There's just a couple of sorry. No one else is jumping. There's a couple of questions. I know Nash has been waiting for. Uh, there was actually kind of something that I did want to add to okay, that. Okay. Yeah, like, I'm going to keep this short just because I know that we are we're going really long on this. Yeah, no but I think the question is even less of like what technology should I learn. Because here's the thing, there are too many things that you can learn in information security. Like, for example, like I'm in identity and access management. Um, there are people who are so specialized in just one specific technology of one kind of specific area of cybersecurity. It's more of kind of con like look around and see what you're interested in. And then ask uh, maybe professionals or just look at things that are relating to that. And then that's where you can find the technology that's more interesting to you. And then that's when you can start learning it. It's less because so, like you can go at, you can go everywhere and yet nowhere at the same time with just the amount of different things you can learn. So I would say it's more of what you should ask, what you want to do, um, and kind of see what technology works at that, and what you, what and you know what would help you accomplish that. But uh, yeah, sorry, go go ahead, Nash, with your question. Yeah, I'm not ready, but so what's your take on like landing your first co-op? Do you mean like if you had if you wanted to get that dream co-op, you got it now? Is your are your thoughts still the same, or do you mean just in general? You know, what are your thoughts on going for that dream co-op? Like what what aspect of both? Both. I mean, both? Like if you already thought that you know I wanted to do something, and maybe you didn't even land the co-op in the thing that you wanted to do, because that thing provides right. for you, which is you know, really I'll tackle it how I kind of thought it thought about this question. There was something that I wanted to along these lines talk about tonight. I really wanted to make sure I got the sense. So this is kind of a good opportunity. First, I'll answer you know the easy part. Um, I ended up, I was lucky enough to get my dream co-op, and I this is definitely this kind of hit the you know hit the ball home. I, I want to stay and doing this you know for a long time. Hopefully, um, I was told some horror stories about this kind of these this role and the duties that it involved. That it might not be what I'm looking for. You might not enjoy it too much because it's not. I'm not going to get into it. I really enjoy it. Uh, it might have to do with my team. I think I got really lucky in that sense as well. Now, going back to the, the pre-obtaining the dream co-op, I really think uh, if the chances are slim, it shouldn't stop you from looking for that dream job. I think it's silly to think, well, there's only you know two of those a year. You're not going to. I think you should still do everything you can. For me, this is the part that I want to talk about. For me, it got to such a point where I wanted this job so bad that like just doing. The technical stuff wasn't enough. It wasn't just a matter of getting all these challenges under my belt, doing all these competitions. It was more a matter of how can I actually, like, you know, be known and make an impact. And that's when I started kind of reaching out to people. And I mean, this is gonna, you know, I don't know what age you guys are, but if you're younger, this might seem sound kind of weird. I started just like cold messaging people. You know what I mean? I would like see somebody that's like killing, it, and I'd be like, hey man, like I, I, you know, I love your work. I'm a first year. Do you have any tips? You know, I'm just. Random people that I've never on like Discord servers that I'd be a member of or on Twitter, you know, like. Um, and one day somebody had posted uh, a, a job posting in the Discord of, of our IF Sessions Club, and uh, you know this is the job that I wanted, the company that I wanted. It probably wouldn't be mine for the next five, ten years. It was such a, it felt unattainable at the time. But I just, again, I cold messaged this guy. I said, hey man, like, how are you? I'm in second year, uh, you know, still along. No, at the time I was still, I was in second semester, first year. This was right when COVID had started. And I was like, you know, I'm still such a long way away from where you are, but you just posted the, you know, my dream job and my dream company. Do you have any tips for me? And he was like, I love your drive. Like, here's all my tips, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, at one point, it got to a point where for the first, like, three months that we spoke, 
we would send each other PDFs as mess messages because the messages wouldn't actually fit in Discord. Like we would just write up like <laughs> genuine like books with screenshots, photographs that would take up my book collection. Like yeah, we, we were, heard. we were. No, this is this is serious. Like it was just a, it was a communication of PDFs for the first like two three months, and finally you know the guy was like, all right, like you know what, like I'm gonna take you on. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be your mentor. You know, and that was kind of the first. That was like what I wanted to accomplish towards this unattainable co-op that I heard from everybody. That like, there's only one, maybe two of these a year, you're not gonna get it. I, I was like, finally, I have like some sort of a internal, you know, I've developed this, this connection. At the time, I was not anywhere near. Even, even now, I'm not ready for this job. You're never really gonna be ready, but at the time, I just knew nothing. You know, and uh, yeah, man, over, over, that was first year, second semester, up until third year, last semester of the co-op semester that ensued. I learned a lot from that guy, and I would say that he had like a huge helping hand in you know, getting me up to that level. So to answer your question, I think everyone should go for their dream job if you, know, if you can put your best foot forward and attempt it. If you don't get it, just don't cry about it, you know what I mean? But you should, you should, nothing should stop you. you know, nothing should stop you. And that doesn't start and end with training and books. It's, there's a lot more to it than that. And it starts you know, with going to these things and messaging people and talking to people. Um, I actually kind of wanted to go off on that because I actually have an experience with failure. Uh, so back when I was at Fleming one to two years ago, I had the opportunity to get a really good co-op. I won't go into details, but basically I think I screwed up my opportunity at the last moment um, to get one of those, you know, one of my dream jobs. And it's, I think, um, it, it may not necessarily have to be that dramatic. Maybe it's just that you didn't have all the right qualifications to get that dream job. I think that the most important, because here's the thing, I think that the reality is most people aren't going to get exactly where they want to be as their co-op. That it's actually a very small minority of people. But the reality is, is a lot of the time, it's more of like thinking, what could I do better? It's not just giving up and seeing it as the end of the world. It's how can you grow from that? And even one of the best things that you can literally ask a recruiter when you get like a job failure uh, or a job rejection, is it right? Yeah, job rejection, is you can ask them, hey, I'm sorry to hear I didn't make it. What can I do better to maybe improve my chances of getting this role next time? Um, even if you get like a really, like, you know, if you get a really tiny co op or maybe it's something that you're not happy with at all. It's more important that you use that as a learning opportunity, seeing where you can grow, so that way you can make it to something bigger. Just because you get a, a co-op that maybe you're not too happy with at the start, that there are people who, from this program, maybe started off with a really tiny company and are now working for Microsoft or some other really big players right now. That's true. And it's more of like, and it's more of just learn, kind of using that opportunity to learn, ask those questions maybe when you aren't successful. That's at least how my experience has been. I think Jackson had a question before. before oh, so really? Yeah. yeah, I was uh, just curious. Do you have any tips for anyone that's nervous or scared uh, for their first co-op experience? Yeah, I would say that's completely normal. I mean, anyone here that says, oh, no, man, I walk in like I own the place is lying to you. I mean, things that you don't do on the regular, no matter what they are, are going to make you nervous. Before I walked in here, I was nervous. You know, I know everybody that's here. I've been coming to this club for almost four years. I don't know if you noticed, I love to talk, but I still felt nervous. Like, I genuinely, like, I was talking to these guys, I was like, don't say anything stupid, don't make me laugh funny, like, don't talk to me in there, I'm, I'm nervous, you know? Now you come in, you calm down a little bit, but as far as the co-op experience goes, oh, yeah, man, my first day, my first, today, I don't, with a client, I'm, you know, doing some stuff, and I'm really, really nervous. I've been there for six months, I'm still nervous, because this is all new to me, it's not, you know, but at the end of the day, that's normal. I feel like if, if you're not, a little bit kind of, oh, I don't want to screw up. That's probably a bad sign. You know what I mean? It's good to have that, I really hope I do well. What if I don't? What if this? I think that's fine. It's normal. Also, uh, like, when you're starting out, there's actually zero expectations when you're walking into your job. Literally zero. Like, they um, just nothing. They'll, they'll take you from, like, the ground up. Like, obviously, yeah. you have to, like, be well good enough to get through the interview process. But, like, when you're actually on the job, there's not that much expectations, and they sort of train you from the ground up. So, that's that don't be nervous at all. Yeah, that's that coachability Christian was talking about during the interview. Like, you can be that guy that just pretends like he knows it all but doesn't and somehow lands a job, but when they get any just, you know, either terrible cultural fit, you can't work with them or he actually doesn't do anything. So the whole the whole thing that, you know, you're talking about being nervous, just be coachable, man. You can go in there not knowing a thing. You got through the interviews, except the the, the, the teachings, you know what I mean? It'll come. I think it's the song. Yeah, the song. I don't want to play like devil's advocate here. Like I also want to say like co op is a 
just like it's not gonna it's not the end of the world, right? If you don't get your dream call, it doesn't stop you. Not even chasing the opportunity to be there, right? So like mm -hmm. don't stress about getting the perfect call. Unless like, you don't, you can always try to get there, right? Like it's not like sure. the door is always closed. It's your first job in the industry. Imagine your your career ended with your first job, it's ridiculous, right? It's, a billion opportunities after this. Yeah, just, just to build on that. I, I actually didn't get my dream job uh, when I first started. So when, when, what I wanted to get um, was actually what Connor is doing right now, which is <laughs> you know vulnerability <laughs> research, which is really interesting because it's not where I went at all. Um, but no, yeah, so uh, don't, you know, don't put your nose up and just be like, oh, I didn't get what I want. Like, this is so stupid. Um, but you, you can't do that because you won't graduate. You have to, like, you have to find yeah, a call. Yeah, you have to find a call. You have to find <laughs> yeah. a call. If you don't get your dream job, um, you have to keep working, right? Also, you're going to be like pleasantly surprised. Like Honestly, for me, I don't know if I have even like a dream job. Like I've realized this over time. It's like if you are willing to learn, if you are willing to innovate, any job can become interesting if you make it interesting, right? If you don't just sort of follow the model that everybody sets. And if you try to innovate, right, every job can become in interesting. And this goes back to you know what I was saying is like find those problems, find the things that everybody's complaining about, and go and fix them, and your job will become inter interesting. I don't want to go to Bell at first, but I did, and you know what? I learned a ton, and you have no idea how much it helps me every day on my current job. Um, so, and, and it's not like by the way I. I actually really had fun at Bell. I would have stayed at Bell. The only reason that I, I didn't was because one of my mentors, who I actually, by the way, met through this club, um, literally came to me and was like, I want you to come work for me. And that was not something that I could say no to because you know, he's, he's just such a phenomenal guy. But, Yo, hey, so I'm curious. Uh, during your time and during your club, what sort of interesting projects or engagements have you guys been Uh, so at least for, for me, as, um, as I mentioned earlier, that I'm primarily in identity and access management, but I've been doing some stuff on the side. At least from my experience working, working at KPMG, is that they allow you to, as long as you're mainly focused on your main team that you've been hired on, is that they don't mind at all if you explore with other teams. So right now I'm doing something with offensive security, which I can't, like, you know, it's for company reasons I can't say how it is uh, word for word, but pretty much is that it's working a lot with automating red team stuff. And it's been really interesting. It's been a lot of fun. I think um, one of the things that a lot of people are able to experiment with a little bit, uh, at least when you're in your companies too, is try reaching out to other people who, like maybe even other teams. Because I think that one of the things that you also want to avoid doing is you also don't necessarily want to only have experience in necessarily just one thing. If you have an opportunity to try out something else like forensics, identity and access management, um, you should do it because honestly one of the things is, is that most people who want or at least maybe not necessarily most but a lot of the times is people will start off somewhere where and not even end up there i really wanted to get into forensics at first but now i've gotten into identity and access management slash offensive security and i think both of those are really interesting topics and that's kind of i haven't even thought about forensics since i've taken my call off um and it's you, like it just um, at least for me it's just uh, i know this is kind of a, a moving away from the question of what are you doing to more of what you can do? But uh, definitely reach out to different teams. See if there's someone who has something that's even totally different from what you're doing, and just say, hey, I don't know much about this, but I'd like to learn more. But uh, I'll leave that, uh, yeah, kind of going away from that question, but I'll leave it to see if any of the other group oh, like it. For me, like my favorite project that I've worked on so far has been like, um, we got to do this Azure assessment, like a security assessment. So like they gave us like tenant access to the Azure instance. Then we had to just do like a lot of vulnerability scans and then sife through the data. So that was like one of my favorite projects I've done so far. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so with what I do, as I mentioned earlier, we work on bugs that people have found in software. And so sometimes with actually the case that me and my partner have been working on for the past month, we spent just one month working on one single bug in one single piece of software. That's the, you know, the scale of some of these sometimes. It's a very large enterprise software that somebody else within our organization, they ran a tool that's called a fuzzer, which is basically like an AI-powered piece of software where it will go through and it will just spam input into a piece of software, you know, millions and millions of iterations until it finds that it crashes. And then it tries to understand why it crashes. So basically this guy ran his tool you know, for days and days and days, 
and it generated this binary file with 35,000 lines, <laughs> and it caused a heap overflow, and that's it. That's all anybody knew. So we were given, <laughs> we were given this, this 35,000 line binary file. We were told, okay, if you open this in this software, it causes a heap overflow, figure it out. That's all we had. And I mean, as you can expect, that's why it's taken a very, very long time to go through and understand this. Um, because so a big thing we do is called reverse engineering, where with most, you know, a lot of software they're written in C or C++, these are compiled languages, so you can't actually look at the source code. We don't have access to the, you know, the direct source code of the C or the C++ application. We actually have to look at the assembly code, which you may or may not have taken a class in yet. There's one in second year, you don't really learn anything about assembly, which is something I was going to mention earlier. It's, it's an awful class, and something I, I want to mention is don't let it dissuade you from doing stuff like vulnerability research. Don't let it dissuade you from assembly just because you know, might not learn very much in it. I, I did not like that class. I didn't feel like I, you know, I learned as much as I should have. I was really scared of assembly when I started my job. But you know, over the, you know, the course of a few months, I have actually, I, it was actually just like a month ago that I, it finally it clicked one day and I was like, wow, I actually sort of understand this now. You know, I can sort of read this. Um, yeah, I, it's been a really, really cool case for me because it's completely you know, original research. And we had, and like this, this file format is from 1985. So there's very little documentation on it. And the only documentation is from 1980s, right? And this is a, you know, it's a very big enterprise software that a lot of very large companies work, work with. So it feels really meaningful you know, to work on stuff that really, really matters and actually has a drastic impact on these companies. That's cool. Question? Um, when it came to your co-op terms, uh, did you guys do uh, the same place for the full eight months or did you do two separate ones? Um, uh, like four months and four months, and then do you recommend uh, one or the other? I, th I think we all, I, I think all of us have done eight months with the same one. We you weren't supposed to though, so it was, yeah, yeah it, Kyle it, and it I depends. should have done two separate co-ops. We were lucky enough to get an extension, uh, like super you know, lucky because it, was, it wasn't going to happen at first. But it's not uncommon. There's actually yeah. a few people in our year that have done the two. I don't know if I would recommend one over the other. They both have their pros and cons. I think if you do the two separate places, obviously it's as a, as a you know, Entry level, you know, worker. You're gonna have a lot of experience in different companies, different cultures, different types of jobs. But also, if you stay with a company for a full eight months, that has its pros too, right? You really start yeah. to learn the stuff. The team starts to maybe they like you a bit more. They get to know you a bit more. You might get called back. There's a higher chance of that. It's they both have their pros and cons. I would say. Yeah, I, I think like if you if you end up doing a co-op for the summer and you don't like the work, which is perfectly fine, and that that does happen, mm -hmm. then yeah, there's no problem with leaving and just going to another. They're not a lot of a lot of, like even if you sign for eight months, if you go to your boss in July and you say, "Look, like I know this is not for me," they're going to be 100 percent fine with it. They they will not be upset with you. They will not get mad at you. That's going to be okay. Um, but you know, if you if you do at least sort of like what you're doing, I I, def, I would personally recommend doing the eight months um, with one company. I found with my role in particular, honestly, like just those four months, like I, I could consider the whole four months just training. I, I feel like I did not actually start doing anything really like meaningful or to the point where I feel like I'm doing you know, real work now and that I'm actually being productive until probably around September mark, um, which was when you know, the four months had ended. Which, I mean, it, it, may, you know, it depends on what you're doing or your, your role, but it's, it's always a learning curve, right? And going to a new company, there's, there's a lot of stuff when you transfer over. At the bare minimum, you know, you're probably not really going to be able to do a whole lot for the first four to six weeks at any role at any company, regardless of if it's an internship or full time, right? There's always onboarding and stuff like this, which you know can't cut into it. I guess I question over there. Okay. I don't know. You. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So when you guys started your jobs. Did you feel imposter syndrome? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Can you speak to it? And like, when we started our jobs? <laughs> yeah. Like, did you have like a like it started and stopped? I think you're gonna have felt that for the next five years, ten years. It doesn't that does not go away yeah, okay. at all. Right. Yeah. I, I, I felt it really bad. Happen. Like especially the night before I started, I was like freaking out. Because this Trend Micro, like this was the very first time they'd ever hired interns for vulnerability research. Um, and it, it, for, for what they're doing, like it's a pretty well-respected company. I was really worried, you know, I was going to come in and my boss was just going to expect me to know all of this stuff. And I know, and I knew I didn't know any of this, right? So I, I was absolutely terrified. 
But I mean, as I think Jem actually mentioned, Jem and Kyle both mentioned earlier, employers are very understanding. They know that you're students, and they have very low expectations for you. Like it's 100% okay if you don't know very much. They're supposed to train you. That's the point of an internship, right? You're supposed to learn stuff on the job. It's perfectly fine. I, I mean, I, I know Jem and Kyle also just mentioned that they, they do kind of feel imposter syndrome. I honestly, I, I have felt they kind of go away. I don't feel it very much anymore. But I think it's, it's probably pretty different with consulting, I think, because all the four of them are all consultants. You know, you're also, you're constantly like, you know, speaking with clients and you are all the time, you know, you're doing stuff that you could say something really wrong, you know, at the wrong time to a client. And that, that is worrisome and the, there can be imposter stuff with that. My job is just 100% technical stuff. I don't talk to clients at all. We just, you know, we receive our cases and then we just work on them. So, I don't know, I think it's a very different environment from you know, yeah, talking to people, being a consultant, and just doing straight uh, technical yeah, stuff. Yeah, if I was working solo, I think, for my job, a lot of what I do is like actually in teams, you know, there'll be two of us, three of us, put on an engagement, and we're like, I'm on like just eight hour, nine hour phone calls with my teammate on this engagement, right? It's, especially with the red team stuff, it's like communication is the most important thing. So, I'm essentially watching this guy who's, you know, five, 10 years in the industry, doing all the stuff that I have no idea what's going on, you know, that's, it's hard to not have imposter syndrome when you're watching that for eight, nine hours a day. It's very like, a, you're constantly reminded that you have this huge mountain of things to learn. It's, you know, and it gets like, you crawl up and down a little bit over the eight months, but as far as it ever actually going away, as long as you work with people that are better than you, which, you know, if you're lucky enough to do in companies where there's people that are much better than you, I don't know if it'll ever go away, man. That, that guy that you were talking about that you work with, when you talk to him, that, that, Dude that just knows and sent the Russian guy. You know oh I mean? god! Don't yeah. when you talk to him, don't you just feel like, what am I even doing here? Like, yeah, why, yes. why, why, <laughs> yes, why yes, would they no, give me this job? Happens. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Why would they ever offer me this job? Because yeah. these people are like the leaders in the field. These are, you know, I, I said it before. I'm not gonna say it again. I don't know, man. I don't know if it'll actually ever go away. I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll tell you. No, man. Well, I'm just gonna keep. I'm gonna try to keep this brief so that I can get his point, or so that we can speak. But uh, pretty much, uh, if it helps, is that like you know whether you're six months into the job like me and you're facing imposter syndrome. Um, for example, like all the way um, to some of the partners that I've worked with, they'll tell you, yeah, that never goes away. You know, even though that they're a partner, they're too, yeah. you know they, they you know they're responsible for these engagements. They're the yeah. ones who are leading everything. They're the ones that we go to information. Sometimes they'll say, yeah, you're, it's never going to go away. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to feel imposter syndrome. Sometimes it can be a, somewhat of a decent kind of defense mechanism. Because the thing is, is you don't ever want to be overconfident. It's kind of what we were going about earlier, is where if, if you start to act like you know too much. Because here's the thing, we really know nothing about the industry. We are still very new. There are people, and you will be working with people when you go to the industry, that have been in this industry longer than, for example, I've been alive. Um, and you know, it, when you really take in like how much time that is, that's a lot of time. <laughs> but um, you know, it's, I, I feel like it's not imposter syndrome necessarily isn't a bad thing. But of course, it's like you know, don't let it consume you either. It just it's more of like I feel like the best way to get over, rid of it is more of just thinking of everything as a learning opportunity and being open to kind of change. I feel like that's helped me a lot with it. But. Uh, uh, maybe I was going to say something. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually really, really funny that you asked that question because next, sorry, not next week, but the week after that, today I was on a call with a client. And the client was like, I want you to get this four gigabyte file off of our network in a FIPS compliant, compliant device guard protected environment. I'm telling you right now, I maybe know like two of those words. <laughs> I have no idea what those words mean. Okay, But in a week from now, I'm gonna fuck around and find out, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's just, especially like in, in, in consulting, um, you are gonna be like, uh, especially my manager, like he loves to do this, like, you know, light a fire under my ass. Like technically, I'm supposed to be doing purple teams, but so far I've done purple teams, Azure audits, Microsoft 365 audits, incident response engagements, red teams, okay? so. Do you think I know all of those things? I don't, right? But it's just through the course of actually, you know, going through the process, you realize there's actually a lot of similarities between those, those different things, right? And you're never by yourself. You're almost, if, if you're at the right organization, if they have a good culture, you are never by yourself. The best way to get over imposter syndrome is go and ask for help. And I just go, I go to my manager once a week and I say, listen, dude, I have no idea 
what those words mean, I, I need you to help me. And my manager will jump on a call with me and he'll explain things to me, and that's how I learn things. And the way that I pay him back is by actually internalizing this information so that when he's having trouble, and he has a lot of trouble with a lot of things, my manager is not a coder at all, right? Um, I jump in and I help him. So two things, one, ask for help, um, and two, you have a lot of things to contribute as well, so make sure that um, you're showing that, um, because that will give you the confidence that you need to get over imposter syndrome. We had a question over there, and then I want to talk a bit about some of the resources mm -hmm. shared and provides for yeah. us. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, like when you first started, did you get a lot of mentorship um, when you had your co-op? Yeah, um, still do. Yeah, so I with with my job we had we had four weeks of training, like just purely training before we went into any actual like uh, vulnerability research work, and we still like every single day. There's there's uh, three full time people on our team, and every single day one of them will have two hours of they just call it an office hour, where you know you can just join in this room and you can ask them questions about whatever the hell you're working on, and they will just sit there the entire time and help you, which is fantastic. So. Yeah, definitely most companies will have a lot of help available. Okay, so Sheridan provides a job board for us. Now, I don't think any of you guys got your roles from the job board. Uh, Nash, you did, right? Yes, sir. Okay, you might, we might have you jump in here. <laughs> <laughs> Come on down, Dad, look at it. Anybody uh, want to talk about their experience with the job board? Uh, what should students know before it opens up? What to look out for? There were some awesome jobs on the job board. I think there was even an offensive kind of job where one, the company was looking to, you know, have you work for them for eight months and pay for your OSCP, if I remember correctly. There was, there was a job in that. Yeah. So the, the job board does not have any shortage of cool jobs. It doesn't, you know, that's just because we didn't get them from there doesn't mean anything. We were applying September and the job board opens in like what March or something, February. So so it's really like it's not a matter of you know, the job board versus external, you should be looking at both, right? Obviously, don't limit yourself to one or the other, but if you somehow didn't plan uh, you know, a co-op position before, the job board has like hundreds of jobs. Like it's some of them, yeah, okay, some of them, I'm not gonna fluff it up too much. Some of the jobs are like, they're not so good, you know, but there are some jobs you're like, I would love that job. and. Nash and Seth, you know, they kind of cashed in and they got some fantastic gigs from the job board. So I really think, uh, you know, it's, it's not, you know, some people will say, oh, the job board, is, there's nothing, there's a lot of good stuff on the job board, a lot. So, so I, I didn't get mine through the job board, but I would say like 80% of people in my uh, class, in my graduating class, didn't yeah. get their job through the job board. Everybody, yeah. Everybody yeah. And, and a lot of people had like two and three offers, so they had to like juggle multiple, mm -hmm. and then, you know, figure it out. Could you stop it except for the first one? That's the problem. Exactly. In terms of time frames for the job board, um, I know some people probably were worried about like when offers should be going in. Um, the time frames when they start seeing like things posted. I remember a lot of people um, start to get offers around like it was late February. Yeah. Um, maybe even March. So don't get discouraged if you're not hearing anything. Interviews were later than I would have expected or anticipated. It's cutting the class. Um, so again, don't be worried if that happens. And if you're not hearing back from the applications, it's, I don't know why it's that way, but yeah, maybe right. February, early March is when you start hearing back. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, so LinkedIn is a oh, huge yeah. one. LinkedIn's good, but I, I don't, did any of you guys apply through LinkedIn? I applied through LinkedIn. Okay, there you go. I applied to everything. I only use nice. this. Okay, so I'll stop talking then. I, <laughs> from, 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 September, from September until December, I think I opened LinkedIn and searched for a security internship five times a day for literally, you know, four or five months. It, it's, it's, you absolutely should use LinkedIn. 
there is a lot of fantastic offers on there, but even more importantly, it's a fantastic way to recruit with, or to network with the recruiters, or maybe someone who does that job professionally from those companies. That'll honestly help you a lot through the process of you know, having someone who can somewhat vouch for you or tell you how to, how to proceed with it, but it gives you a better idea of what to expect in that company, in that environment. Um, it, you know, it, it's just a fantastic way to, it, it kind of works with itself perfectly. November. Yeah, we started early November. September for me. Mo most September. most companies don't post until January. Some of them will post in you know early November. I think all of us applied to ours in November. Um, Jim says September. I applied in September. I got my first interview in October. Yeah. That that is something that only very few companies will do. It's that. not common. Yeah. Very it's very common. few companies will do that. I think the only ones that you'll see like like open up like early like September. November September are like CrowdStrike, Mandy, and like the really big. I didn't know there was um, a you know, like those like US companies. I'm not going to invite you to compute. Yeah, I think I can actually answer that. Because um, I've been looking at co ops right now. So I, I've noticed a lot of American companies have already started posting um, yep. their offers. Or not offers, their job postings. Yeah, job postings. Um, from what I've heard, it's pretty difficult to get sponsorship as a uh, co op student. Sometimes the fang companies will be very helpful. But if you do have American citizenship, then are you Christian? I'm kind of, I have the work interest here. Are you? Well, tech to see if you have a green card kind of thing. Oh, okay. I see. So, I mean, maybe that's something to look into. Um, yeah, yeah that, was, that, was, that was a question. I was looking email to the advisor asking if I, could, if I got an internship in these states, if I could go there and do it. Mo the only companies that will sponsor visas are typically like Fang, you know, like Facebook, Amazon, those. They are either going to be those ones or similar size. So most companies don't sponsor visas. If you can get an interview at one of them, they, they will, though. But you also specify when you're applying to them that you would need it, and they'll only contact you if they can. I would also take like logistics into, into consideration. Like, Are you prepared to pack up and move over there for the next eight months? Wouldn't you want to? If it's remote, obviously, that's not a big deal. But if it's no, not, if you there's, get a, lot it, you to, you, there's you a lot of stuff to, there's a lot of stuff to, yeah, eh? It's oh, like yeah. That. Worth noting as well is if you are interested in potentially applying for like a job in the States or something like that, you're also going to want to look a lot earlier too because that is actually a very long process or can be a long process. Yes. So if you apply around January or February for it, chances are you're not going to get it just because of how long it would take for, our, you know, to come to submit papers, do all that kind of stuff. So if you're looking at potentially doing something overseas, you have to look now, I would say. Yeah, and those companies posted in August. Like they, they're, they're most of them will still have applications open, but you need to apply very early for them. And their interviews take a really long time, like over a month. So like the now they can pretty much. Yeah. I think there was a question up there. Uh, my question was kind of just a side tangent, but like, how is like COVID and things like that affected like maybe your co-op or like your day-to-day -day lives? Oh, it's made it so much better. It's so nice. Yeah. <laughs> hybrid, hybrid work is the best work environment. <laughs> Like, having it be optional to go in is fantastic. I would not want to commute five days a week. Sir? Do you think it has like a negative impact on your call? Since you're not, no, really not like on seeing me. seeing people as often or things like that. Actually, I don't think it has for me, but... Not at all for me, yeah. For me, it did. Uh, it really just depends on your personality, right? Like, I'm the type of person, like, right now, just sitting like this, talking to people, this is like, uh, you know, I love this, right? Um, but if you're... And actually, I was just talking to Christian about this. Um, like, I'm the type of person that will not be nervous talking to you and like looking you in the eye, but if I'm behind a screen um, and I can't see your face and I can't see how you're reacting to what I'm saying, I'll actually get very nervous, right? So it really depends on your personality and just like how you interact with people. It was definitely a challenge for me. Um, I don't think I would like, like to go in five days a week now that I do work from home. Um, but I think it would be really nice for me to go in like twice a week or three times a week yeah. you know, see the cyber my coworkers. Yeah. I find that like at least like when you're able to see your coworkers in person, I think it makes it a lot more of a fulfilling experience, especially when you got like after a company events. Because you know, you don't want to just be at at least for me, like you know, maybe other people disagree on this. But um, at least for, for my preferences is I like to be able to socialize with my coworkers and meet them in person. I don't just always want to worry about work when I'm talking about them. And I find that just helps to get you to know them better. I find it helps a little bit, a little bit more on networking when you're able to be in person versus, you know, just being on remote. But uh, 
at least for me, so I, li I like having it optional. Yeah. yeah. Sure. But what it means is that you, be because you, um, if you are working like a remote job, the networking is not just going to happen naturally. You you have to you have to make an effort, right? Um, and people are generally pretty good about it. Like, right? don't be afraid to just like message people and it's like, hey, what do you do? Let's have a virtual coffee chat. Like that's mm -hmm. totally totally normal, right? Like I do that all the time. Um, actually, next week, like I'm going to Denver for an engagement, um, and this is my first on-site engagement ever, right? <laughs> um, and it's nice because I get to you know interact with some of the people there, some of the people that work at Laris will be there, so, um, you know, when those opportunities are presented to you in a kind of remote job, especially if you're in a consultancy, especially if there's travel, take those opportunities. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So another That's, resource that Sheridan has is a co-op class in the winter term. Uh, can you guys talk a bit about that? Um, is it like an actual class? Do you get grades and stuff? Yeah, I'll, I think so it's, it's, it's pass-fail. Yeah. It is, there's, but there's I'll no say something about that class. Like, uh, we were talking about this before. No, no, I will. I will. And <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna. <laughs> You're gonna I'm, do I'm it. Gonna. Okay, so. I'm gonna. But no, I'm not gonna say what you think I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say, for some people, that's not the most useful class. But I actually, well, after we spoke about this, I was thinking about it. There were some people in our co-op term that have never had jobs before at all. Like they just haven't worked at all before. They've never handed out. They've never made a resume or had an interview. So I, after we spoke about what we spoke about. Mm. It kind of I started thinking about it more, and I could see why you know in a college environment they would have something like that. You know, coming into this program at my age or at Kyle's age or whatever, you come in with all this experience and other stuff. Did you you be might, old? I said my age, and <laughs> I said me too. You know, so <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, for us, it was I'll just I'll you know kind of cut it short. It was pretty useless, I would say. There's not a single thing that. You know, I, I appreciate the effort, and I know now that I think about it, why it exists. But for, for some, some of you guys, you might just think, you know, why is this happening? Why am I here? For others, if you are coming here straight from high school, there's some cool stuff in there, man. The star system when you're interviewing, you know, like the, the I don't know what it stands for, but it's, it's stars. It's, 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 acronym, it's useful you know? if you have never applied to a job before. If it's your first job ever, yeah, exactly. If, exactly. If, if you've, you know, done interviews, you've made resumes, it's right. probably not going to be Definitely. a whole lot of new info. Definitely writing those like impact statements, like that is something you actually do in that class. That is really important. So that that is, yeah, that is really important. Like definitely from the communication side it's good, but I find it's more tailored towards like finding a job, not necessarily finding a cybersecurity job. Right. And I'll pick on a couple of things like, uh, you know, that class says I need to have my resume at one page. Um, I think that's awesome. like the... It's impossible. Yeah, it's, it's just, how are you gonna show everything? In business school, because I went to Western before coming to Sheridan, that made sense because the recruiter was looking at like 500, 600 resumes in the space of a day, right? So it had to be just a glance. But for most of the jobs that you're gonna be applying for in cybersecurity, there's probably five other people competing for your job, right? So every single detail of your resume will probably be read. So you might as well you know, put in a whole lot of effort into making that resume. And something that I found that was uh, that like um, you know as a little bit unfortunate is like at least like or at least kind of going on with what um, Jim was saying earlier is where it's more catered towards maybe if you've never had a job is like there's going to be more focus on what you've done in classes what you've done um, or at least with your grades and that's what I've noticed is that it was more meant like if you really hadn't done much like for example someone like me like um, where I like especially like you know with Jim and Kyle and what well, 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 everyone here where they have a lot more experience is that um, you know is that I had a lot more projects, I had a lot more CTFs, I had things that I wanted to show off that were kind of related to the industry. I even had a job in IT before that I wanted to show off, but I kind of felt a little bit penalized for that because it was felt they wanted to show off more school things. But again, is I think it's more meant for maybe if you don't have those experiences. Yeah, I was. Uh, I, we had, there was an assignment we had to show, you know, our current resume, and we were asked to improve on it in X, Y, Z ways. The teacher would look at it and you know critique it and do this, that, and the other thing. And while we all did it to you know get whatever the it's pass fail, but just to do it and say we did it just to show that you know that we listened to the advice. And then at where Kyle and I worked, there was a little exercise. I think you remember that with the Ignite team where we actually got to oh, yeah. have an exercise with the with the Mandiant you know, recruiters and the HR, and they did the exact same thing and they took. I don't want to get. I don't want to badmouth 
things too kind much. Of opposite but advice. It was yeah, like I had to do exactly how I had it before, change everything back to how I had it before because none of it applied. She just they, not just there was a whole bunch of them, they were all just like, Man, yeah, like this is all wrong. Like this all has to get flipped around over here and it ended up looking more like exactly what I started off with. So there was uh, Exactly what Louis said, a bit of a disconnect between the InfoSec world and the general kind of student looking for their first job world or the general, you know, career world. It's, it's a pretty big difference, I would say, I think. Yeah. Just want to put something out there, by the way, um, just over, over the years, because I've, I used to be very involved with the club. I've gotten like a lot of resumes, like people ask me to review the resume all the time. If that's something that you want me to do, um, honestly, like anybody on this panel is like a great resource. Happy Sorry to, to volunteer. No, I, don't <laughs> mind, honestly. I was, was going to say that at the end, you know, as far as reaching out for advice, messaging, whatever. Yeah. But that's, I'll say that's all. We're more than happy to, yeah. right? Like, like, and uh, actually, I kind of want to go back to like an earlier, very early question about like networking. I actually really hate that word mm -hmm. because it's like it implies that everything that I say or do is like has to be done in this like super robotic <laughs> like professional context the point of this club right the point of this club is that you're here to make friends you're all a family you all have shared interests right um you all interact with each other so use the resources that are available to you right like um and uh, like these guys right here right i've met every single one of them through this club right um, it's true. We all got our jobs because of things that we did with the club. No question. Directly, yeah, I got my job directly. We've me. all helped each other over the years. Like Jem and I, Jem will be like, Louie, when are you coming to work at Indian? And I'll say, Jem, when are you coming to work at Laris? And we're at an impasse right now. <laughs> 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 so we'll see what happens eventually. Um, but yeah, yeah, form form those connections. Honestly, like it. The, the, the best resource that you have is the people around you and the people that came before you. Um, use that alumni network. We are more than happy to have you. Yeah, this club really is like kind of, it's beyond alumni. I feel like there's alumni and there's people that come to this club that take part in this club and I think you're, you're part of a community that no one's obligated to help each other, but it really says something when you say, oh, like, you know, you used to go to sessions. Oh, yeah, like five years ago. I love that place. You go to sessions now. It's like a huge uh, connecting. I mean, in Toronto, everybody knows about sessions. There's, you know, it's, a, it's as far as student-run um, communities go, it's a, it's a big club for sure. So along the lines of uh, getting involved with the club, you don't have to be an exec to get involved. I mean, uh, you can always uh, message me or use the speaker sign up form in the Discord if you want to say present the news or if you have Bingo. some cool project you're working on, you can do a middle segment or even a full length segment. Always feel free to reach out. Um, Crazy we're CTO's always happy to have right. members get involved with the club. Do a project then if there's anything cool you're working on, we just have that segment, you know, twenty minutes, you hop on there and you show what you're working on. Any troubles, you get some quick input. You know, it's a I don't know if you guys still do that, but there's a lot of opportunities. Being a part of the club does not mean you are the treasurer or the president or the community manager, being a part of the club, it really just means coming to the club. But if you really want to be a part of it, I mean, I mean five minute news segment, you know, two minute news segment, what is it? It's nothing. Honestly, it's nuts how much you learn from actually like doing those news segments. Like it, it, I know a lot of people um, kind of take it for granted, but when you actually read the news and you're able to regurgitate it and you're able to research on those little things that you might not have known of before, Honestly, it's one of the best ways that I've learned from doing the new segments last year. You learn to speak the industry, right? That's, oh, a, good, that's a huge you one. You learn to just speak InfoSec. It's one thing to learn it in class, but you're never really talking it. You don't, you know, it's much different to, to verbalize InfoSec. Jesus. I want to go over there. You guys love the news. Oh, the news? <laughs> Another, another, sorry, just one, one more yeah. point. Yeah, another thing I'll say is that, like, as someone, as someone <laughs> who uh, has been, you know, in, in Jack's position, and I'm sure Kurt uh, and, and Nash will also, uh, you know, comment on this, he has a really tough job, right? Um, meaning that it is unfair to put the expectation on him that he has to think of everything and he has to do everything. This is a club, this is a community. 
the members should contribute just as much as the executive team, right? He's got as many assignments as you guys do, as many deadlines and due dates yeah. as you guys do. He's still trying to make it Yes. And doing and great. No, no doing offense. No offense. When I walked into this room today, I felt like I was walking to a funeral. Nobody, <laughs> nobody was talking to each other. What's going on? <laughs> okay, you're all sitting there. Mingle. Speak, say things, right? Hey, what are you doing? What's your name? How's it going, right? It's, it's, it's honestly not that hard. And if you start here, if you start here, you can do it on the job and you can do it for the call, right? It's, it just takes a little bit of practice, right? Here, here. Yeah, that was the like I saw a question over here. Yeah, I, was, I was wanted to ask regarding um, the interview process. Did you any of you guys get interviewed by like a panel or was it all solo interviews? And did you guys also ask any like really good questions at the end regarding the company? I think most of my interviews were with multiple people. Um, okay. it's two, I'd say two is probably the standard from what I've seen is like two interviewers. I think you know more than that. It's it, it happened a couple of times, but it's not very common. I don't know. I think it's kind of silly, especially if you have like four people. It's just unnecessary. It just freaks the candidate out, right? I mean, you, you're not really gaining anything from having four people there. Obviously, not all four of them are going to ask questions. Um, regarding your your second part, yeah, and I know this is probably something you've all heard before, but it is it is really true that it's it's very important to actually have questions to ask the interviewer. Typically, like try to think of something about the role. And I think it's, it's probably easier with security than a lot of other jobs because a lot of jobs in security, like nobody actually knows you know, what you're doing. Like I had almost no idea what the hell vulnerability research actually meant, right? There's not very many companies that, that hire vulnerability research. I've never even seen it on a job posting. So you know, I went in and I asked my, my interviewer a bunch of questions about it. Because I also, I was like, how does this even make money, right? It doesn't make sense. Like, how is this monetized? And stuff like that is really, really important because it shows that you are actually really thinking about, you know, why the job exists and how you can actually do well at it. It's, it's a really big deal to do that kind of stuff. Huge. Yeah, basically everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> I, you I have a follow-up question. Yes. Do you still listen to K-pop? I do, of course. <laughs> I love K-pop. K-pop is fantastic. Honor got me into K-pop. <laughs> but what is it, twice? Twice. Boya, boya, boya. No, no, I'm not singing it here. Sing it. <laughs> it's good. Twice is fantastic. <laughs> listen to twice. If I ever interview you, any of you and you mention twice, you're in. <laughs> some more questions here, but I don't want to sure. hold anybody here hostage. Um, let's see, I got one on Discord. He's wondering, you know, how useful is it to have your own website when you're applying for jobs? I don't know anyone. I do not have a website. Not, yeah, I mean, cool, but I don't think it makes any You sense. You could maybe yeah. add some stuff to like a GitHub if you want. No, it's not a big deal, I don't think. Like if you, if you have like write-ups or something like that, I'd say just put it on GitHub and just link your GitHub, but that's, even that is not, no, necessary. it's not necessary. It's like, cool if you, you have one. Yeah, it's cool if you can have it, but don't stress about it. Yeah, it's not necessary. One thing that I do that um, I find almost no one else does, like with their resume, which I recommend you totally do, is have like a sample work section. So for example, let's say that you, you know, uh, decided to do like, to speak at IS sessions, right? Um, what you can do is, all of that is recorded, right? So you can literally just take that YouTube link and just add like an appendix at the end of your resume and just be like, hey, you want to hear me speak? You want to see my communication skills? Go to this link and see what I'm interested in, right? Um, if you have like a project, put it up on GitHub and then link to that GitHub project, right? Um, I was one of the people that worked on the um, infrastructure for the CTF a few years back. So that's a big project for me that I put up. That was a huge reason why I was hired at Laris is because I showed that I have knowledge with cloud and, and you know, GCP and stuff like that, which is not something that a lot of people um, are interested in right now. So that was a differentiator for me. So. Can you kind of like just add on that? Because like maybe like every month just do like a journal entry or like a summary of what you've done for the month. Just because like- That's a good idea. That's, you look back that's a really Every couple idea. months, it's kind of hard to remember what you're doing, right? So like if you check in every month and just have a bunch of examples of things you've done, you can always pick out an example that might fit a job application better or things like that. So. 
That's a really good idea if you're actually doing stuff. So you should start doing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I, I love the idea. I'm going to start doing it. But I really think you know, you, to be able to do that, you have to start doing stuff in the, in the community. Because if you're not doing anything, don't bother journal. That's a diary. <laughs> That's fine. I have a diary. There's nothing wrong with having a diary. I'm just saying, this idea, you know, you got to get active, get in the talks. Do You're a diary. Stuff. Today, Louie looked at me. <laughs> That's daily. That's, how I, that's my daily. Identity. When do I not look at it? <laughs> <laughs> so, still have quite a few questions. Um, I think these guys already mentioned uh, that they're always willing to take questions via Discord. I did put a message in stream questions. I'll try to pin it uh, with their discords, left to right. Um, are any of you guys hitting money hands tonight? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. So uh, if you want to come out, out, I'm sure they're more than willing to answer questions. Let's leave it at this. Uh, just one last question. What would you guys say to somebody who is worried about not landing a co-op position? I would say don't worry about not landing one. Uh, I would say, you know, put your best foot for forward, um, put in whatever kind of external work you can, and at the end of the day, the cards are gonna fall where they're gonna fall, right? You're not going to, if you want to graduate this program, you're gonna find a co-op. You're not, not gonna get a co-op. It's a it's, I would say it's a guarantee that you're gonna get a co-op. You know what I mean? It's, I hate to say that it's a guarantee, but I think it is if you're gonna graduate. Where you get the co-op is up to you, I guess, kind of, but. If you're here today, there's a good chance of getting a co-op. Oh, if you're yeah, here today, yeah. yeah. For the people that are here like today, it's 100%. Important. Like, uh, if you don't get a co-op, who will? But I really think, yeah, that whole worry of like, oh, will I get one, will I get something? Stop worrying about that. Go, you know, do your projects, study, get good grades, come out to the session nights, meet people and network, and you're gonna get a co-op. There's no, there's nothing that, I don't think I ever like worried about any of my friends or anyone not getting the call off. It's such a, yeah. don't worry about that. There's, there's like, there's two things, two things that I would, I would say, like one is why you should not be worried is one of external factors. So you're in one, of, it's an industry that has a huge labor shortage, right? And that continues to be true and will continue to remain true for a very long time, right? So it's not like there are no jobs out there. You might be hearing a lot of things about like inflation and toxic recession and stuff like that. But honestly, the cybersecurity industry um, is kind of a unfazed by that. Unfazed, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great word. So Thank you. don't 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 really don't really worry from like you know a market forces perspective. On a personal level, if you're worried, ask yourself why are you worried, right? Um, because there has to be something that is fueling that worry. Are you maybe not volunteering enough? Are you maybe not doing enough projects? Are your grades not good enough? And then, then you know, just be analytical about it, right? What is the problem? What is making me worried? And then tackle the thing that is missing, um, and try to you know put an effort there, and you'll find that you'll get a call very very quickly. Kind of going off of what Louis said, like even if let's say it's the worst case scenario and you don't even find a call off. Remember is that those four months or eight months, however long it'll be, is a very insignificant portion of the rest of your life that you're going to live, and even more so your career, um, or maybe the other way around. But um, pretty much is the most important thing you can do, and especially because here's the thing, everyone here is going to fail at some point in their careers, whether that's right now, whether that's four years from now, nope. 10, 20. Uh, nope. Nope. Not, not Anybody here like a fishing nope. lake before? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> But the most, important, the most important thing that you can do, is, especially in times of failure, is just learn what you did wrong or what you can improve on from that point. I like it. I, yes, I, something that I want to mention that we've kind of alluded to a lot, you know, we've talked a lot about these extracurricular things you should do. I know a lot of people come into this program really wanting to do pen testing or like red teaming stuff. Definitely don't get like tunnel vision, that's, that, that's the only thing you can do. Security is a huge field, and pen testing is a very small section of security. You know, in, in the GTA, there's maybe 15 max pen testing internships, which, and that's, I mean, it, it, like you're competing against a lot of people for that kind of stuff. You definitely can get them. There's definitely a lot of people from our program that do get them. If that's what you want to do, you need to do extracurriculars. You will not get an offensive security internship if you're not doing extra career no. That's It's kind of the, the, the ugly truth behind it, but it's just something really to keep in mind. If that's what you're interested in and that's what you want to do, 
It's not, it's not optional. You have to. Yeah, there's a lot of supply in this in the computer security industry, but especially for offensive security, it's one of the ones that has less demand, but a lot of supply, so it gets super competitive, which is why that yeah, you know, like for example, like uh, probably most other jobs you could get in with zero other experience, but offensive security is a bit of the exception, I would say, to that. I mean, well, even though I said the other ones you can require zero, obviously having more is a way better, but offensive security is a bit of an exception. So that one you really, you really got to try hard on. Yeah. Or, but the thing is too, is that even like you can even just accidentally end up in there, and, you know, just from networking or from, you know, all these other ways of getting in. But um, pretty, like, if you don't get your dream job on your first try or your second or your third, it's more of just, you may end up there. You may end up in somewhere else that you may find equally or even more exciting. It's more of just, I would say, that's why you can never really give up if things don't go according to plan. It's more of kind of learning how to plan things out after that and knowing how to get back up even if that next plan doesn't work. Growth mindset, baby. Boom. All right, so I think that's a wrap here. Uh, thank you everybody Woo! for coming out. Thank you to all of our panelists. It was a good time. Um, Let's go to Monty's. Yeah. <laughs>